Hello and welcome to the eighth episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series chronicling Uganda's key political, social, and economic events since 1944. I'm Bart Kakoza. In the previous episode, we saw the growing tension between Buganda and the central government and the resolution of the lost counties issue. In this episode, we take a look at the events surrounding the 1966 Buganda crisis. Thanks for joining us. In 1966, the government of Uganda under the Bank of Uganda Act established the Bank of Uganda. There was a study, a study carried out before the dismantlement of the uh, currency board. That study revealed that uh, it would not be possible for us to have one central bank in East Africa. And it was resolved that each country, because they were at different levels of development, therefore their requirement, monetary requirement, money supply requirement were different. Yeah. And therefore one central bank would probably not manage to cater for the different interests of the different economies at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was decided to go a separate central bank. The bank opened for business on August 15, 1966 at Liverpool House, Plot 14, Parliament Avenue, the site where Jubilee Insurance House is located today. There was a Liverpool building here on Parliament Avenue. They took that out and they built this one. This is where we are. This was the first location of the central bank. Governor Moviru was the first governor, a very honored personality in this country. He was the first MD of the Uganda Credit and Savings Bank, first MD of Uganda Commercial Bank, first governor. On that day, Uganda's first national currency also came into circulation after the collapse of the East African Currency Board. When the Bank of Uganda was established, the small denomination were no longer applicable, so we dropped they dropped those and they started with ten, five, five cents, ten, and, and fifty. And denomination, likewise, the denomination, there was no much change in the denomination because it was real ten, twenty, uh, and, the highest was and the highest was a hundred. A hundred shillings. A hundred shillings, which Shilling was, was the equivalent coin. then uh, in the East African terms. The 100 shillings was equivalent to 5 pounds, of course, at the rate of 20. The bank later moved to its current headquarters on Plot 37 Stroke 43 Kampala Road on the 6th of March 1970. Now, the currency independence came at the time when Uganda was embroiled in a political crisis. Prime Minister Obote had just usurped all powers of government following the struggle between him and Mutesa over control of government and the army. This resulted into a series of events that culminated into serious unrest, particularly in Buganda. We see a sequence of events, a sequence of events uh, that were perpetrated by both the Mengo government after that, because uh, that had aborted, their strategy had aborted. So there were uprisings in Buganda, for, for example. Uh, there were attacks on uh, uh, police posts. Uh, and um, there was this Nakurabye uh, massacre of okay. about seven people. Uh, the police, I think they were coming from uh, Hoima side. And you know Nakurabye, that's where the route to Hoima is. And uh, I think they were booed and uh, 
there were people in Nakurabius tried to uh, push out them down and the police fired at them and killed about seven. Uh, and uh, that was symbolically uh, very, very challenging because you know Nakurabia is also near Kasubi, uh, which is a very important royal here. So it was like crushing um, the, the, the pride of Buganda. And after that, then there was another incident where an army truck was involved in, in, the, in an accident with the Kisubi uh, Buganda boys and many died. On the other side also, uh, you see the Kabaka machine gunning traders in the Buyaga market, uh, killing them. On April the 15th, 1966, the constitution was abrogated formally during a parliamentary session. A revolutionary constitution was adopted by the MPs who had not even seen it beforehand, let alone debated its content. This constitution later came to be known as the Pigeon Hall Constitution. This was the constitution that was uh, hurriedly drafted and they put in the Pigeon Hall the members of parliament and they came in, uh, but they were making a speech, introducing it, and telling them what the constitution is, and saying that you are going to find it in your pigeon holes. And normally, that's uh, certainly, it does not, that's not the procedure for any law being passed by parliament. And most certainly, it cannot be, it should not be the procedure for the constitution, which is the basic law of the land. People need to debate it, need enough time to digest what has been proposed. But uh, it was what they call a fait accompli, you know, it was a foregone conclusion. That's backed by law, by force of arms, rather, because, uh, uh, as you know, the parliament was surrounded by troops. Because it was broadcast live. I listened, I didn't hear point of order, I didn't hear point of motion, I didn't hear anybody opposing. And this man stands there and talks eloquently as he used to speak for over an hour. And then he says, I have abrogated the constitution. He said, but I know you people are interested in the constitution. So when you go out, you'll find a constitution in your pigeon hole. The crisis came to a head on the 19th of May when the Buganda Luchiko passed a resolution demanding central government of Uganda to leave Buganda soil within five days' notice, asserting that Buganda was taking this stand in response to the abrogation of the constitution. And they said, no, we can't have this. This constitution was arrived Dutch in Lancaster House by all of us. Now this man is taking uh, his unilateral decisions to abrogate it. No, but remove your, yourself from 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 Buganda. Obote's government perceived this as a confrontation and treasonable. His first reaction was rebellion. That's what he said. Rebellion. In other words, we played into his hands. You know, it was a game not well played. We had the good reasons on our side, but tactfully the tactics. Okay, the strategy was good, tactics were bad. That's how this thing started. The entire crisis of 1966, UPC as a party, UPC organ, never was met to discuss and pronounce on any aspect of the 1966 crisis. Never did. The central polity, the central entity, central authority, and Mengo authority. Obote seized the opportunity to crush Buganda. He immediately reacted by declaring a state of emergency throughout Buganda on the 23rd May, and the following day, May the 24th, under the command of Kano Idi Amin, the Uganda army staged a bloody attack on the palace of Kabaka, on Obote's orders, presumably to preempt a coup. Mrs. Joyce Mpanga, one of the first women parliamentarians, was married to Mengo's attorney general. Her father, too, 
was the head of the Kabaka's palace who was wounded and subsequently mysteriously went missing during the attack. The evening before the actual storming of the palace, I had gone to commiserate with, the, with my neighbor. Then I see a Land Rover and I knew it was a palace Land Rover. And Land Rovers used to frighten the villagers. They say, eh, the Land Rover? I tell the war, don't go back. I said, no, 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 I know it. So I came here and I found my father had come to see me. Why? Because after about 11, we had been told the really is surrounded by soldiers and so on. Yes. So he came to check on me. And it's strange because I never sat with my father on the same chair. But when I came in, he was sitting on a big I came and sat with him. He said, Omani, tonight we are being attacked. Normally my father would not have stayed in the palace because people, married people don't stay in the palace. But he told me he was going to stay there. Nim can't hear why. Said, oh, this is what we swear. Supposing they come to attack my Kabaka, and in the morning I come and tell him, Kulibakulike? No, 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 no. I have to be there. <laughs> so, I knew he had stayed in the palace. At about three, you began to hear gunshots. Really, I was worried. In 1986, after the NRM came in, I said... Henry Chamber, a government technocrat turned politician, was at the time president of both his principal private secretary. He was privy to the events as they unfolded. I did the things which are on my fingertips. So? I just that as a PPS, I must... Uh, I've kept quiet. You know, people believe that Obote actually never intended to to storm the reveal. They said that he asked Idi Amin to go and search for the weapons. Uh, no, look, I, the Kawanawas had been gathering in the reveal for several days. Is it true? They were there. My, my own grandfather, who still lives today, was one of them. Because have, having been an ex-soldier, and when he heard that we are calling upon ex-soldiers to go in, in the in the in the, in the really fight for the Kabaka, he left here and, and went. So, and then in Buganda, we there was a lot of praise, a lot of praise for the strength of the army, of, of the of the Kabaka's army. You know, singing songs and uh, so I think Obote got frightened. Obote now made allegations that um, the Kabaka was actually importing arms. Uh, he, he had approached uh, some uh, embassies uh, to, to get arms. Uh, we, we, we don't know whether really that's very true, but if you read the Kabaka's uh, book, the discretion of my kingdom, he said that he, they, they contacted friends. He approached the British High Commissioner and Ghanaian and other people to find out what can be done because he said, look, there's going to be war. These people are going to fight. If they fight, will Britain come and help us to, to maintain security? Now, Obote blamed Mutesa for doing this and threw him out of state house. But in 1964, there was a meeting in Uganda army. Obote himself as prime minister invited the British troops to come and save him. Now, why do you punish Mutesa for doing exactly the same thing which you did yourself two years earlier? Officially, the Kabak had under the constitution Long before independence, a hundred men and arms. They were there, even under the British. And they were armed. So that could not be taken as an offense, a breach of the constitution. 
if however kabaka may be halalitombo because of the time because he too had intelligence i don't mean this one i mean the police they could tell him you know what's happening obote is doing this obote is also doing this people like um, oporot who was commander at the time of the uganda army he would come and tell him certain things because he was he used to be his president he's a commander in chief so if say, okay, if this guy is prepared to do this let me buy another little whatever here and everybody knew that to deal with to get the kabakarisi we need a fight they asked oriema the inspector general of police in my presence whether he could do the job he said no the police was not in a position to deal with uh, that eventuality that's how amin was telephoned ramin appears and is given marching orders to go and deal with he says okay i'll go and organize it was late in the evening he said obviously had been in, in, i think they had intimated to him earlier that he could do the job so he goes it was a pre dawn attack starting at about 5:30 a.m. the special force an elite army unit supported by the first of the eight infantry companies that made up the Uganda army launched their first incursion against Mengo's palace Kalala gate most of the attackers deployed around the 6 foot high perimeter wall encircling the over 1 square mile palace here's Mengo palace here's Katikiro's residence when they came that night they placed a gun shooting at my residence and shooting at the into the palace why did they shoot at me did i have guns there and uh, first thing in the morning we hear tu 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 i was in i was also in uh, nakasero road i had a house there when he did the first job and came and came and then when the fighting got tough he came to us for final authority to storm the village at in the afternoon and uh, uh, i mean he was obviously enjoying the fight he was joined we said i want to and but uh, said you go ahead we said go 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 ahead and he he goes he goes back the government troops made their way into the palace through the gate and dashed across the open ground Kabaka's troops most of them being World War II veterans equipped with inferior weapons outnumbered 10 to 1 could not match the troops superior firepower 72 year old John Kasozi Mwonge was one of Mutesa's bodyguards who put up a brave fight to defend the Kabaka during the attack Idi Amin had unleashed the heavy artillery and within a few minutes we hear big bang boom Obviously, he was using those millimeter cannon shells. He, he, he punched the Trekobe, punched the front where the Navagirika were staying, and they walked out, filed out after that. Mutesa himself never stayed in front; he stayed in some houses behind. The Kabaka's bodyguards retreated. It started to rain, a violent thunderstorm which caused the lar in the battle. Around. three on the, on that day the faithful day of the attack of the rubidi rain came from nowhere and it concentrated mainly around the palace of, of, of the kabaka it rained so heavy to the extent that fighting stopped from both sides and this is where the kabaka decided to escape from the palace 
Kasozi narrates that together with other eight fellow bodyguards, they retreated with the Kabaka towards the six-foot palace perimeter wall and helped him jump over. He made his way to Ubaga. He was received by, received by Cardinal Suga, who was not a cardinal yet. He was the Archbishop of Ubaga. Gave him some tea and so on. She gave him a rosary. <laughs> Besides the loss of lives, the palace was almost completely destroyed in the course of the fighting and the looting which followed. They killed quite a number of people. I think the official figure was about 53 or something, but it could have been more. I went round the Rubiri after the, the, the next day. My father was the Mukuluwa Rubiri. Mango. I was just sitting to wait to hear the fate of my father. Anyway, he was shot in the leg. When they came to collect people to take them to Luzira, the people who were alive, he said, uh uh, don't take anybody wounded. So he stayed there even for the next night. But when they released the people who were arrested from the palace, then we knew for certain. We didn't get the body. Hmm? We didn't get the boy's body. One person I really respect is Jack Sentong. He was PS Treasury, but he helped. He was my friend, and was a friend of his wife. He helped me look. But we couldn't find my father, neither could we be told about the body. I don't know, I'm not sure whether any other person in that office at that time, given those circumstances, uh, would have acted differently. All right? I, I think my only blame I can apportion to Leto Bote is that he failed to analyze and establish the, the seriousness or the um, the truth hmm, of what was being said. It's a lot of nonsense to 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 couch this in terms of, you know, here is somebody from Lango, you know, who happens to be prime minister. He's a non-Muganda who happens to be prime minister. Here is a northerner. You know, here is a leader of UPC. It, it could have happened with anybody sitting in that chair. If Benedicto Kiwanoka had been elected, if DP had won the 62 uh, election, had become prime minister, it would have happened with him already had began to happen with him even when he was prime minister earlier and before he was prime minister. Mutesa subsequently managed to sneak out of Uganda and fled into exile. The route was through Busiro, Gomba, then Mogola, and then through to, uh, to Burundi. Yeah. Because in Burundi there, there had been a king, King Bambusa was friendly to the Kabaka here. And when he, when he heard that the Kabaka had escaped and that he was seeking asylum, he called his cabinet. They, they received the Kabaka, gave him some help, financial help, and a, a plane to fly him to London. I understand the Kabaka said about Obote, well, he's sending me away he too will suffer that, that sort of similar fate. Kabaka died outside his kingdom, outside his own country, Uganda. So did Obote. I don't like it. I'm telling you what happened. Of course, after the flight of the Kabaka, the Uganda, there was a lot of unrest, um, which was followed by Obote arresting their leaders imposing a state of emergency over Buganda, uh, suspending even elections, uh, 
creating paramilitary organizations to ensure that uh, uh, they enforce uh, that repression and state of emergency. You know, there are laws that are always designed to, to, to protect the state, uh, to create law and order. So such were the laws. Um, <laughs> detention without trial, that they could detain you uh, without trial. We see also Bote going overboard, uh, being too repressive, um, and um, th that increased his unpopularity. In September 1967, the Republican Constitution was formally promulgated and came into force. Under the Constitution, members of the National Assembly were deemed to have been elected for another five-year term. The Constitution maintained a multi-party system of government and abolished the kingdoms altogether. So what was the reaction of the other monarchs? Uh, in Angola, they celebrated. The people celebrated. They were happy. Uh, uh, but the others, which enjoyed the semi-federal status, of, of course, uh, they, they couldn't do much. Um, um, uh, Vignor also lost out. It lost out. Um, and uh, we see that actually Obote had a strategy to really squeeze his opponents. Well, that's all we had time for now. In the next episode, we shall focus on the events of the aftermath of the 1966 crisis, the assassination attempts on Obote's life, the Common Man's Charter, the declaration of Uganda as a one-party state, and the events that led to the 1971 Idi Amin's coup. Thanks for watching. See you next time.